Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to another episode, and I am very excited to share this story with you. Jeremy is an amazing person who is having a big impact on youth. And while it may seem on the surface level that she's having an impact on youth in the beef industry, the reality is that she is helping impact youth who, whether they decide to continue their involvement in the beef industry or pick another career route, they are going to turn into educated consumers and voters for us in the future, which I think we can all agree is very, very important. Now, Before we dive into Sheremy's story and hear her advice, I do want to remind you that I am doing podcast coaching. So whether you are interested in starting a podcast for your business, starting it for yourself as a hobby, or even monetizing it, I have different courses available for you as well as a workbook. So if you are interested in determining if a podcast is right for you or you're just ready to dive in, head to the link in my show, mo- show notes for podcast coaching and you can connect with me and we'll figure out what the right route is for you, whether it is podcasting or maybe you need to take another route to apply your passion. Happy to have that conversation with you. Now with that, let's visit with Jeremy. Well, Jeremy, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. I mean, you've I I say this to a few people, but you've been on the list for a while and I know we've been Facebook friends for a few years and um, we think we've bumped into each other down the road somewhere, even though neither one of us can quite uh, pinpoint the exact event. So I'm excited to have you on here and talk about your story, but even more importantly, what you're doing to help develop youth and promote the beef industry today. Shay, first off, um, I, I want to say congratulations and thank you for what you're doing. I've, um, I enjoy just kind of following along your journey. And I think telling our story is obviously really important and providing uh, information streams in a real practical way is something I think you've done a good job on. And I appreciate that um, from a cow-calf producer standpoint. You, you have kind of, You kind of found your niche, and I think that's cool. So congratulations on doing that, and I appreciate that. As for um, my journey, it's I've had a cool ride, uh, best way to describe it, and uh, I can just tell you re- briefly, um, grew up in South Louisiana, showed cattle uh, under 4-H there. Louisiana has a really strong 4-H program, but I also uh, had a couple of families um, that showed Angus cattle, and that was had the opportunity to get to travel with them to some junior nationals. My parents were incredibly supportive, and I'm like fourth or fifth generation uh, in agriculture. Our family um, on both sides had sugarcane, and then uh, on my mom's side had a dairy, and uh, have had beef cattle in small ways. So I went from there to Clarendon Junior College, then to Texas A&M, found my way uh, into a uh, congressional internship in Washington, D.C., At that point, um, I didn't even know the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. I actually did the internship on a dare, so it's kind of a fun story. But uh, that led to a job uh, working for a U.S. congressman for a couple years as an ag LA, and I was in and out of the district um, in Central Texas. But that really opened my eyes, um, number one, for a passion for legislation, and two, just kind of how our government is run and what happens in Washington, D.C. So that was a big takeaway for me. Uh, Spent some time in uh, state legislation, uh, state agency doing some water work. Ended up uh, at Camp Cooley Ranch, a place where in Central Texas we sold about a thousand bulls a year. And then went to Silver Spur. Uh, Silver Spur is in Wyoming and Colorado, New Mexico, Nebraska. Uh, Was involved in several faucets of that uh, organization. Uh, everything from their all natural audits and working with all natural cattle uh, all the way through the genetic component and AI programs for a couple thousand heifers every year. So uh, then ended up back here in Texas. And if you think of Texas um, or Houston as a clock and where I'm at now at Tomball, Texas would be at 12 o'clock. Uh, if, you, if Houston was a clock, we sit at the top of the clock. And I, I bring Houston up 
because it's important to um, this story and the the journey. Um, along the way, I've had some really neat opportunities to get to show cattle, um, lead a lot of national champions uh, while I was at Silver Spur, and then help a lot of people along the way. Um, but when we came back, when I came back to Texas, all of a sudden I was placed in the middle of a, a metropolitan area and it was a, a huge awakening. So Texas has the major stock shows every year, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Houston, et cetera. And then you break it down and you start figuring out and learning that eat, there's ag chapters, like within maybe a hundred miles of me, there's probably a couple hundred FFA chapters not to mention 4-H in addition to. So there's a huge audience of potential consumers. And that's kind of where this next journey ha has started, where, where um, the next piece comes in. That is a very cool ride, as you said in your own words. And before we kind of dive into what you're doing now, I want to take a step back to that experience you had in DC. How did that, can you dive more into how that opened your eyes and the importance of sharing our story as beef producers? Sure. So um, I'm going to date myself here and, and say that I was there during the crafting of the 1995 Farm Bill and NAFTA, things like that. And was um, that was during for my internship. And then the 95 Farm Bill would have been when I was working for Congressman Edwards. But what you learn when you're in D.C. is that D.C. is run by a bunch of 20-somethings. And you, yes, you have congressmen and senators, but the true legs, feet on the ground, legs making things happen, are a much younger generation who don't have true life working experience in a lot of ways especially when it comes to agriculture. And so you begin to have conversations and you find out that they don't know the difference of a beef cow and a dairy cow or how uh, electric vehicles might uh, affect a beef producer that lives in North Dakota, say. So I'm putting that, putting that in today's terms. We were dealing with a lot different challenges at that time when I was there. What I learned while I was in D.C. is that we have to tell that story about um, what we are about in agriculture and how we provide food for citizens of the U.S. And that is, I think, the core of what I came away from with DC in D.C. was that, that was one thing. The other thing is, is I came away when you would have different industry organizations come in and talk to uh, maybe it was Congressman Stenholm's staff or Congressman Edwards' staff, and, and you had multiple different organizations from the beef industry come in, and then you'd have staffers come to you because they knew you had a beef background and say, well, which one of these groups should we really believe? You know, is it this group or is it that group on the national level that's right? And so that really helped me to understand how important unification is in our industry, that we should be about the beef industry. And the in, inward fighting that we have sometimes is really detrimental um, instead of positive. And, and so that's another thing that I, I feel really strongly about is that um, we are should be, when we go to DC, we should be about the beef industry and agriculture as a whole because those folks don't know the differences. And that's become something that I'm pretty passionate about is encouraging people to become involved in industry organizations and work for unification. Wow, I think we we could go down that rabbit hole if we wanted to, but that's not why we brought you we on, get, why I brought you on today. Part. Maybe that'll have to be like a part two or sure. three. We'll see where the conversation goes, but so that was really one part of your story where when we talked previously, you said that shaped um, a lot of your viewpoints today or was very impactful on your life. Maybe that's a better way to put it. But then you also mentioned that you had a shift in mindset when you went from working on larger operations, going back to your own cow-calf operation. And can you talk a little bit about that mindset change and experience. Sure. 
So two, two things there. Um, I could have just really easily went to my day job, as I call it. Um, I work for Westway Feed Products as the national marketing manager, and we provide um, liquid feed, value-added liquid feed to beef, dairy, and feed mills. And I could have just simply went to work every day, let that be my passion, but I just couldn't let go or chose not to let go of the cow side of things. Um, I get to judge a few cow shows, and I didn't want to be somebody that judged cattle shows and was telling people what was right and wrong about cattle and didn't actually lead, feed, breed, calve, take care of cattle. So I decided to continue on with raising cattle, even though I live basically, um, I mean, really close to the Houston, Houston Metroplex. And so the difference is, is like when we were at the Bell Ranch in New Mexico for Silver Spur, I mean, a pasture there, I can remember there was one pasture that was 18,000 acres. Um, my pastures here at Tomball are maybe five acres, 10 acres, five to 10 probably is. And so it brings a different perspective of how you manage your ground, how you manage your soil, your grass, et cetera. But you also, um, you don't order mineral by the truckload like we did at, at Silver Spur or Camp Cooley. You order mineral or you just go get mineral by the bag. So your economies of size change, your, your buying power changes, um, as simple as your vet relationship changes. There's so, so it what it did is the reality is, is in the beef industry today, we have a much greater percentage of producers who have one to 50 cows than those that have over 5,000 cows. And it brought me to the reality of I'm in a sector of the beef industry now that's probably more realistic to the majority of beef producers. And I face their challenges where I wasn't facing the same challenges when I was in corporate ranching. And it has made me, um, I think I'm a better producer because of it, because I have to find ways to add value. I have to find ways to watch cost. I have to find a different customer base. Um, for example, I mean, I love big contemporary groups. I mean, I, I, there's nothing better to create better cattle than to have large contemporary groups. But where I'm at, I can't do that because my customer base on selling heifer calves, the first thing we do is we sell heifer calves at weaning to kids for show heifers. It kills me to break a contem contemporary group like that because I know what it is when you have big data or large data sets. So those are just some of the things that it, it, it's been a mindset, a lot of paradigm shifts to, to go. But the biggest thing is the opportunity to touch consumers is when you begin to live in this area, um, you pull into the gas station, you have a trailer load of cows and there's little kids there that, oh, I want to touch the cow. Um, or you have conversations with consumers or you overhear conversations maybe in your workplace or um, just in the community, you begin to understand that there's a, a constituency that has no idea how their food gets to the table. And it begins, that has, is, has become my passion uh, of just, um, it's a God-given thing of why I ended up in humid South Central Texas again, after I swore I wasn't going to live where it was humid ever again. <laughs> But, I, you know, there's a reason, and I think that's the reason, it is to help tell that story in a different way to future consumers and today's consumers. Do you have cool season pastures that you wish you could graze in the summer? Or maybe you graze corn stalks but wish that ground could provide a little extra nutrition. Or perhaps you watch your fallow wheat acres bake in the sun all summer, providing no additional income. For all these situations and more, at Green Cover, they've got the seed and expertise to get you covered. They listen to your needs to design a custom seed mix that works for your unique situation. They grow over 60% of their inventory through contract producers, and they deliver it right to your door, no matter where you are at in the country. With over 120 species in stock from sorghum sedans, millets, and cowpeas to oats, rye, clovers, and peas, they have everything you need to keep your ground covered and feed your livestock. Reach out to their expert sales team to get a quote today or visit their website at greencover.com. Okay, Jeremy. So I really appreciate all that background and you talking about those mindset shifts and paradigm shifts that you had to make when you shifted from 
you know, your DC experience back to ranching and then working from big ranches to being on your smaller ranch. But I really think that ties into what you're doing today in the next part of our conversation. So tell me about how you got started with working with youth and what you're okay. doing today. So it really, it, it starts probably back when I, when I was in 4-H growing up. I had a lot of people that taught me and encouraged me um, to share as I learned. So I think it goes back to early days in South Louisiana. But then along the way, um, at Silver Spur and at Camp Cooley, we had some intern programs, um, had a lot of great young people that would come and spend the summer with us or help us breed heifers. And that really started a passion um, for teaching young people in a practical hands-on way. And I think that opened the door for me to understand that I can present things in a pretty uh, simple, fun way that kids can retain it. And, and so that probably encouraged me, I guess, to grow that. And then as I looked around, um, when I came back to Texas and, and, and looked around, I, I saw the need for foundation building with kids. Um, Sullivan Show Supply does a great job with their clinics and what they do um, in, in terms of teaching kids about hair and fitting, touch on showmanship, et cetera. But I wanted to go further back than that. I wanted to go further into um, the foundation of setting kids up to be successful. But then I got to thinking about how can I incorporate the beef industry with that? And what we came up with just over time is that I wanted young people to understand if they show cattle, they're part of the beef industry. They're not just showing a heifer or a steer. They're part of a, either they're going to be a consumer down the road, a decision maker in their household, or perhaps they're going to go back into agriculture as a beef producer. But there's a whole bunch more of them that won't be for beef producers. And I wanted to make sure that we were instilling in them some of the positives that we do in the beef industry. And that's what led to what we call the Not Your Ordinary Cattle Clinics. So share a little bit more about what you're doing at these clinics, how you're getting that message across and equipping these kids. We use showmanship as the vehicle to get kids there. That's the just bottom line is that they come to these clinics with the idea, um, how are they gonna learn more about showmanship? And we talk about cattle management too. We begin to integrate, um, you know, if you do some things at home correctly, then it sets you up to be more successful uh, in the show ring. But along with that is, hey, for you to be successful, your heifer needs to, or, or steer or bull needs to be vaccinated correctly. That means you need to handle your vaccines correctly. Did you know that that's important to consumers, that how you vaccinate your cattle and then how you handle your cattle? So we go back and, and while they come to the clinics to attend for showmanship improvement, they leave after we've done several sessions with the understanding that they're part of the beef industry, they're long-term part of the beef industry, and that we do things in the beef industry to set livestock up to be the best um, and safest consumer product that's possible. So when that kid, say from Central Texas or South Texas, um, you know, I'll use an example. I was at a, an ag school or a high school a couple weekends ago, and they have kids that live in neighborhoods that come to the school farm, feed their cattle twice a day. And those kids will probably never, ever ranch or raise cattle in volume, but they have show cattle. And to them, it's just about going to a stock show. They didn't necessarily tie it together with the whole beef and meat part. So I try to connect that. And then um, we do a little bit about structure and, and on cattle structure of the why so that they understand when they're showing cattle, why they do some things. But that structure piece ties into, and I can tie genetics into it too, ties into sustainability. If you raise the right cattle, um, then those cattle are going to be more successful, more longevity for a rancher. That's what sustainability is about is having the right cattle in the right place for your generations to come. So it, it's, and we are flexible in those at those clinics. If um, 
there's a group of kids that maybe we have a set of kids that are really that have shown quite a bit then maybe we go down one trail if we have a bunch of 9 10 11 year olds maybe we uh go down a, a different trail so it, it's flexible um we're going to do one in Oregon in central Oregon in July and that one is very geared to um, basic foundational kind of pieces, setting the foundation for those young people to win in showmanship. But we're going to talk about the beef industry, too, and how they can be a part of the beef industry. So how do you determine location for these clinics? It started out, uh, the very first one we had was in College Station, Texas, at Texas A&M, because it, it was just local to me. Um, and then after that, uh, it's been word of mouth. Um, folks ask. And I, I really, it's been a couple of years since I ran an ad about them. I hadn't even put anything on, on Facebook here lately about it. Uh, just because of time and, and running cows, I'm limited as to how many of these we can do. Um, but it's just word of mouth. Uh, folks hear about it, see pictures, and then they um, maybe talk to kids. That, and, and once I, I, I kid about my kids, I have a I personally don't have any children, but I have a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And so those, I think those kids talk about the clinics too and um, encourage others to attend. And that to me is part of the success. What is the most rewarding part for you about hosting these clinics? Seeing kids, maybe not even the kids, kids who win, that makes you feel good. But kids who make improvements or kids that will come find you at a show or just reach out to you and say, hey, I did this or I spoke to my 4-H club or I talked to my eighth grade class about why we vaccinate cattle or things like that. Hearing back from the kids that they took what they learned and applied it and reached out that's the, the most rewarding piece to me is when it reaches, when you hit the understanding with those kids that it's more than just showing cattle, that they're part of the beef industry, um, that's when it's really fun. So what advice do you have for others who are passionate about teaching kids in the beef industry? Well, I'll take it to, at an adult level first, and then I'll, I'll move to a, a young person level. I'd say as adults, we in the industry have to recognize that we can't keep talking inward. We can't just keep talking to our industry. Um, we have to do more where we talk to consumers and, and, and potential consumers on the East Coast, the West Coast, in metropolitan areas because ultimately that's where the voting constituency is. And that's, if we don't win votes, agriculture isn't here in five, 10, 15 years down the road as we know it today. So, so that's really, really important. And then once you, the next step is, is that we have to encourage young people to not be afraid to have conversations with their peers. Um, talk about, you know, that kid that uh, says he wants to be vegan or doesn't believe in showing cattle or raising cattle. You Number one, you need to be factual. Number two, you can't be combative. Um, and you need to understand their perspective and be respectful. But we have to have those conversations uh, on both the adult and the young person level. And, and I encourage people, um, what I tell them at our clinics is, is learn five facts. Just, you don't have to know everything. Maybe you want to talk about upcycling, how cows convert grass to protein, or maybe you want to talk about um, how important iron and zinc is in nutrition of development for young people. Whatever your stream of, of what you feel comfortable, pick five or so things and, and learn those facts really solidly and able and willing to talk about it. You know, when I'm in an airport, if I might have a conversation with, with somebody about hey, that looks like a really good vegan burger. You ever thought about you're not getting enough iron from that? <laughs> you know, something like that. You have to be willing to have those conversations. And it's not always easy, um, but we have to win the constituents uh, or maintain and win the constituents across the country. It's about voting, to what it comes down to. It is. I appreciate that perspective. I know in my own advocacy is something that, I have to remind myself, and it's something that 
you know, I was, I was told all through junior high and elementary, junior high, high school, how important advocacy is. And I never felt comfortable having those conversations. And really when I started getting more comfortable, it's when I understood that it's about listening and sharing the facts and sharing your story. It's not about changing their mind. Yes. Wouldn't it be great if we could, but if they can share their side of the story, that's not going to change my mind. I'm not going to quit eating beef. Right. So, but just being willing to have that conversation is important. When I travel, I make sure that I wear either one of my lazy three shirts that say building better beef or I, a Westway feed product shirt. And you get, you have conversations. People will say, you know, what is that? Or, or something like that. And it's not about necessarily, like you said, convincing somebody, but if you could just plant the seed and maybe there's a fact that you can provide that that makes them go, huh, I wonder about that. Maybe I'll go look it up. I think Mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Don't be afraid to have conversations outside our industry. We have to stop only talking inwardly. Absolutely. It's not comfortable. No. It's important. Right. Right. Um, it's fun to, to travel and, you know, uh, sometimes you'll, I get to travel and you have somebody in a cowboy hat and there's somebody that is not very comfortable having those conversations and I'll lead them into a conversation with the person sitting next to them in the airport or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it gets fun. You can have fun with it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sherry, is there anything else you want to add to this conversation or anything else we didn't talk about today well we probably could talk about a lot (laughs) I know (laughs) (laughs) I think number one I've had a lot of mentors and I tell young people um, find your mentors and I always kidded about having a a quote board of directors and uh, people like Minnie Lou Bradley James and Mary Lou Henderson um, my mom other folks John Maurer were really influential for me. And and so I tell young people, find your board of directors and ask those people, am I on a good track? Am I doing okay? What should I do different? I think that's important um, for young people. Uh, Don't be afraid to try. Um, I I have a lot of conversations with young people before they're headed off to college and you don't have to know what you're going to do your freshman year of college, those kind of things. So I, I think being open-minded is really important to all of us, whether it be in the beef industry or choosing a career, those kind of things. Um, I think just having our young people know that we're going to have to work harder to maintain the future than our previous generations did is important. And so that's why I have a lot of conversations with kids entering college. They're going to have to try 10 times harder to maintain our lifestyle as what their parents or grandparents did. So I think that's important. Absolutely. And I was just at our North Dakota Cattle Women's Conference this weekend. And one of the quotes shared by a speaker there was, um, and it wasn't her quote, it was a quote she was sharing. And I don't remember who said it, but it was, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, doesn't it just lie and rot? And I think, you know, when she talked about, how important it is to share our message. And I think that just really resonates, especially with how fast things spread on social media, news outlets. And we're in such a world where hooks and headlines sell, even right. if they're misleading. Right. That so. That is. And, and so, so don't let social media be the sole source of their education. Um, be willing to have those conversations, whether you're an adult, you're a high school student, you're in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I think you have to be willing to have those conversations. Well, and be the friend. And if they have questions about, like, if people have questions about the methane or environmental side, I'm maybe not the best person to talk about that, but I have friends who can, and I can share them I'll in find that direction. Find that, and be willing to open your doors. Is we... Um, you know, you have to let people come in and see, um, my cows probably are on a better nutrition program than I am. If you want to know the truth, uh, or you, you know, invite those neighbors who aren't, or, or, you know, people who don't necessarily, um, make their living in agriculture, invite them to come see what we do. So they understand 
um, the conservation, the stewardship, all the positives that we do. Because if they don't, if you don't have them on locale, they're not going to know um, all the positives that we do. So I think that's important too: is be willing to open your doors. Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate the conversation today and you being a guest on the show and sharing your story and everything that you're doing for the youth in our country. Well, you're welcome and keep doing what you're doing. I think you're doing a great job. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you, Jeremy, for having this conversation with me. Now, if you listen to this episode, I'm really curious what your thoughts are. As a reminder, I can't read your mind uh, through our phones. So please send me a message, um, whether that's through my website or on social media, and let me know what you thought about the episode. If you have other guest ideas or topic suggestions, I'd love to hear that. I'd love to connect. I really just appreciate understanding who's out there listening. So with that, be sure to let me know your thoughts today. And if you're on Spotify, you can even put a comment there below the episode. But happy ranching, folks.